Hey guys, uh, I am Svetlin Nikolov from the Phoenix team. And I'm Georgi Shekov. And we are about to show you the new stuff that we added to Phoenix 5. So uh, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to walk you through the change walk that we have on the Chaos Docs site. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, all of the new features, the new improvements. And uh, we're going to tell you uh, everything that we know about them. And we're going to show you some simple setups uh, with, uh, with simple basic geometry, low res simulations, just to, uh, just to give you an idea of what uh, all of the new stuff can do. And uh, yeah, but basically that's it. Yeah, we're going to play around with uh, some simple setups and show you how the new stuff works. So let's dig in. This is our release uh, change walk. And you can find it on docschaos.com. And when you click on Phoenix, and in here in the version change logs, we have 500. So here we have the release video and what's new uh, in our new builds. So uh, we have created new things for the active bodies where we have uh, created uh, a directable trust force and a new tool that's called. Axis lock that allows you to lock the movement of bodies to a certain axis so that they can move only uh, horizontally or uh, vertically. And let's see how this works in practice. So, in here, uh, I will import this speed lock model that we have. Okay. And Right away, we can uh, show you how the new stuff works by using the speedboat preset that sets up all the new things for you. It sets up the thruster force and the axis locks right away. And if we create a preset, we can notice that our boat is a bit rotated. So let's rotate it. And we can see that my model got imported with uh, the wrong. Uh, uh, center point. So let's go and fix this. Uh, here, I'm going to select affect pivot only and center it to object. And now we can rotate our degrees. So let's do it exactly 90 and start the sim. And what we have for this sim is we have an active body thruster node that has picked our boat and it has a certain magnitude. So the magnitude is uh, how strongly uh, our boat will be propelled forward. And we have some initial velocity so that uh, our boat uh, won't start from zero and it will uh, have some velocity at the start of our simulation. And for the axis stop, what it does is it allows you to uh, affect a certain body. Again, this is the ball. And we have locked the translation on the Y axis. So if I go in here and rotate the camera a bit, you can see the Y axis is in here facing to the side. So the boat won't move to the side. And we have locked the rotation on the X and the Z axis. So the boat won't rotate this way and won't rotate uh, this way. <laughs> so essentially, the, booth, uh, the boat will move up and down and move, uh, will rotate forward. Yeah, it, well, it, it would pitch, yeah. but it would, not, uh, it would not steer to the sides and it, it would not roll. OK, so actually, uh, let's run the simulation uh, with a bit lower grid resolution so that it goes faster. I will reduce the total cells number to 1 million cells. And let's start again. And we can see that our boat moves with a certain speed. And if we want our boat to move faster, what we can do is we can go in here in magnitude. And I can say that we need five times faster boat and just our accelerator 
And as you can see, uh, the boat is moving only in a straight line because the axis lock prevents it from going uh, to the side, but it's bouncing up and down. And of course, uh, for the thruster, you can always animate the value so that uh, it starts from zero and picks up the speed or uh, it's moving faster and you animate it down to zero and our boat will be stopping at some point. And so that we don't wait too much, uh, I think that we can already see what's going on. And if I go in here and scrub the timeline, you can see that we have our boat that's creating nice foam and it's jumping up and down. Yeah, it just managed to bounce well. Yeah. And of course, uh, if you want uh, to restore your simulation and pick up from where you left off, we have introduced this cool new button on our Phoenix toolbar that's called Restore. And if I press it again, you'll see that we go back to the previous backup frame and our simulation picks up from there. So uh, if your power went out or if you decided that uh, you need to, uh, to take a break and resume your simulation later, uh, the restore button is a nice way to do that uh, instead of uh, starting again from frame zero and waiting uh, 30 more frames. Just a note, if you're new to Phoenix, you can control the backup frames from the output rollout of the simulator. So by default, Phoenix saves the entire simulation state uh, to the cache files at each 15 uh, frame. But you can change this. You can, uh, if you change this to one, then it would mean that uh, you would be able to restore from any frame. Or if you set it to zero, you won't be able to restore at all, but your caches would be uh, with the smallest possible size. Now, if I go into my simulation rollout, and we know that every 15 frames we have a backup, and when we get to the 45th frame, we'll see that in here, uh, in the cache file content window, uh, we'll have a message that this is a back frame and you can restore from here. Here it is. Okay. So this is about the new thruster force and the new axis lock. So what's next? We have a new and enhanced preset. So we have quite uh, a few new presets. Uh, so we already shown the speedbot preset that we have. The next thing that we have added, again, for the active bodies is the ice cubes preset. So let's start from the beginning, our preset scene, and let's make a few boxes, like so. And what we can do is let's position some of them like so, so that we have some variation. And let's pick our ice cube preset. So what it does is it creates a simulator for us and an active body solver that has our boxes uh, ticked in the interaction list. And if we start our simulation, uh, our simulator will be initially filled with some liquid. And our ice cubes should start floating around and colliding with each other. And if they hit the walls of our simulator, we have uh, added a brand new option that's called jump walls as obstacles. So what it does is if the walls of our simulator are jammed, this will mean that uh, the active bodies will treat the walls as colliders. So they will bounce off the walls. And you can see from here, this cube hit the wall and it's bouncing back inside. And the other ones are floating as well. And what we have added for this preset is if we go into the Phoenix property lister, uh, the property lister uh, shows 
of the nodes uh, in the scene and their Phoenix properties so that uh, you can easily change uh, many values at once. And in here, we can see that the mass density, the mass or the density, uh, in this case, the density for the cubes is randomized a bit so that each cube bounces uh, or reacts to the fluid a bit differently. Yeah, some of them will sink, some of them will float for longer. And of course, these uh, are not necessarily ice cubes. So you could use this preset just as a quick way to, to set up a simulation of any kind of floating debris, boxes, cardboard boxes, wooden boxes, whatever, pieces of uh, broken spaceships or, or uh, yeah, whatever you, you like. It's just an easy way to get started with active bodies. It just creates the active bodies over it, connects it into, into the simulator, picks it in the, in the dynamics rollout, and uh, just saves you some time that uh, you would otherwise have to do this manually. And as for the uh, property lister, uh, Phoenix bodies still have their uh, individual object, object properties also accessible. So here in the property lister, you can see the, uh, the object properties of all of the uh, possible geometries in the scene. But otherwise, from the right-click menu, you could still access the old uh, node properties, which are per object. And these are the same. So you can use whatever you like. If you want to adjust one body at a time, and it's easier for you, you can do it from this menu, or if you want to change like all the bodies at the same time, you can just shift select uh, the tick boxes here, and you can just type in another value and it will change it for all the boxes. Yeah, especially in cases where you might have hundreds or thousands of objects and you want to change some of the properties, just make them non-solid or change their uh, their mass or their, their density, the property lister is the way to go. Otherwise, it would take you a lot of time. Now that we have changed the density to 200, so our bodies uh, will be a lot lighter. So let's see how they will react to the quick. They should be floating a bit more at the top. I can see that they are not sinking this much. And yeah. yeah. So and there, there is also one more thing that uh, we can show that uh, active bodies don't, uh, they work with the liquid solver, but they don't really need liquid. So, for example, we could just uh, turn off the initial fill up and uh, we would have just a plain, pure, rigid body simulation without any fluids. Yes. Let's disable the initial fill in the dynamic draw and if I start the simulation again you can see that our bodies are start to fall down and they're colliding with one another and if they hit the walls of the simulator they should bounce back like so. Oh yeah this also uh, brings me to another thought that if we disable the option to use the uh, giant walls of the giant walls of the simulator as obstacles. Uh, for example, you could have the active body simulation happening uh, anywhere. It doesn't even have to be inside of the simulator. So you, you just have to have a simulator somewhere in the scene and the active bodies would continue working. So for example, you could create an active body ground plane, which would constrain them. Yeah. Otherwise they would just fall forever. In this case, they're falling forever. But what we can do is go in here and create a plane. Like so. And in the active box solver, I can say turn on the ground plane and pick this plane in here. Now our bodies should start colliding. And if I remember correctly, it's a bit different in Maya. There we have a special Phoenix ground plane node yes. that you have to create. So Otherwise, in Maya, you just use a jump. If we go back in Maya, uh, and I can just create it. And in order to save step time for the setup, let's go and pick the ice cubes preset again. And I will move the simulator to the side. And in here in the liquid rollout, I will disable the initial fill up. And what we can do is go into the Phoenix FD menu. And in here in the create uh, menu, we have the active bodies from plane. In here in Maya, this is a procedural helper. Uh, that's not 
renderable and it won't affect the rest of your simulation at all. It will just affect the active bodies. And I can shift select my active bodies over with my ground plane selected. So they're both in the selection. And I can go in here and turn on the use ground plane and set the selected object as ground plane. And if we start the simulation again, you can see that our bodies are falling and bouncing across the ground. Ah, they started doing different things now. Yeah. <laughs> they started off similarly, but then things changed. So this is how uh, active bodies are working in Max and in Maya and uh, how the new presets look. So this is uh, these are the new presets for the active bodies, but we have new presets for the other things as well. So let's see what we have. Oh, really? Cool preset that we have upgraded is uh, the fire preset. Or should we just show the stormy sea pre pre preset first? Yeah, yeah, let's, con let's continue, let's with, the continue with the liquids. Let's continue with the liquids. Okay. So in here, we have a stormy sea preset. And I will go into my settings for the grid. And I will reduce the resolution so that we have a bit faster feedback of what's going on. And we'll start the simulation. And let's go under our preview and you can see that the, the detail reduction turned on. Um, this way, uh, when we rotate our viewport, we get immediate feedback of what is going on without uh, too much slowdown. But if you want to get a better sense of what the sim is doing, uh, we can we turn off the auto reduction and set to zero. And immediately we can see a better preview of how our simulation looks like. And what the Storm C preset does is it creates a wave force that will uh, create waves inside of the liquid simulation. And compared to the ocean preset, these are real simulated waves and not just the uh, displaced waves. So this will show up not, not only uh, inside the uh, not only during render time, but uh, there will be waves splashing uh, as, uh, directly with the object that we have created for the preset. And of course, the waves, while they're simulating, they will uh, create splashes, uh, foam, and mist. And in order to simulate the real movement of mist, uh, in the storm sea, we have created a plane force that will affect only the mist particle. So this way, uh, the mist will be blown away uh, in the direction of the plane force, uh, while the other particles will move uh, with a different speed. And this will create a sense of uh, wind in a stormy sea scenario. We can actually show you how it looks rendered on the dock side, where we have all of the presets just rendered out as uh... well, what we can do is go in here and under the quick simulation setup let's go to the storm c actually you can see uh in here all the setup they just need a bit of time to load because there are a lot of videos in here and let's scroll down a bit to the bottom, and we have the storm sea. This is how it looks in action. And of course, you could increase the resolution even further and get even more details. But uh, I think that the default resolution is around five or six million voxels, yeah. which is ultra low res, so that it runs uh, quickly. But uh, yeah, you could you could get a lot more details with uh, with a better resolution and the uh, overall shape and behavior of the simulation should be pretty much the same because it's driven by the wave force and it helps keep things similar between low and high grid resolutions. And meanwhile, if we go in here, well, the preset is almost done. So let's stop the scene and oops, let's center it. And if I scrub the timeline, we can see how our waves uh, start forming and they start 
splashy inside and crushing and colliding with the object in our scene. So this is quite useful if you want uh, to uh, create a shape or an oil rig or a lighthouse, for example, uh, whenever uh, you need um, stormy weather and uh, some uh, random waves that are hitting an object, this is a nice way to start uh, your scene and tweak it uh, the way that you like it. Yeah, the object that you use for the preset is going to be solid, is going to be static, is going to just be an obstacle to the simulation. So it will be there for the waves to crash into. And actually, another, uh, while we're talking about waves and uh, simulations and splashes and mist, uh, this is a nice cool uh, setup that we can show uh, what we did for the active bodies. So if I create an active body solver in here and pick our object. So let's say that we want uh, our sphere to float up and down uh, together with the waves, but, it's, but we want uh, the foam and mist to be born only around uh, our object. So this way, for example, we can save a bit on simulation time and we can dial down the settings a lot faster without having uh, so much uh, foam and splashes generated everywhere. So what we can do is, uh, in order to make this sphere active body, we have picked it in the active body solver, but we need to link the active body solver to the uh, simulator. So in the dynamics row, I'll pick the active body solver. And if I start the simulation now, actually, did we reduce the grid resolution? Yes, we did. Yeah. So if I start the simulation now, you can see that it created a Phoenix uh, a clone for our object, and the original of our object went uh, non solid and non renderable so that we can have uh, only the active body interacting with the sim. And right now, if I leave it, you probably notice that it's way too heavy and it's sinking. Yeah, That's so it. the difference between uh, between before and this setup is that the, the sphere is still an obstacle, but now it's also an active body. So yeah, first off, we have to uh, adjust the mass or the density of the active body so uh, it keeps floating and doesn't sink to the bottom of the sea. Yeah, currently it starts sinking. So I will stop the sim and let's go into the Phoenix property lister. In here, I will select the sphere and let's choose something real light so that uh, we make sure that uh, it stays always on top of the simulation. And let's start the sim. And what I wanted to show you uh, for this setup is. If I go into the foam rollout, in here we have bird volume. The bird volumes are nothing new. They're uh, in Phoenix for quite a while, but now uh, you can use uh, the active bodies as bird volumes as well. So now uh, we can choose the bird volume in here, and we need to pick our original object so that it works correctly with our simulation. And let's do the same thing for uh, the foam and uh, the, the splashes and the mist. And if we do this right now, you'll notice that there are no particles born at all. <laughs> no particles. <laughs> no particles. So why this happens is because uh, the active bodies are solid by nature. So this means uh, that uh, they will uh, kill everything that is inside of them. And what the bird volume says is spawn particles only inside of the volume of uh, the selected object. In this case, uh, our volume will delete the particles, so that's why we don't have any particles. And what we can do is choose increase this volume fade distance. What this will do is it will take a radius around our object 
and it will start spawning particles there. And this one is in centimeters. So if I select my sphere, you can see that it's around 47 centimeters. If I go back here, I can increase the fake distance to 47. And let's do this for minutes and for Tom. And this way, natural birth of foam and splashes and mist can happen even around the sphere. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise, uh, liquid particles, splashes, foam, they cannot penetrate the sphere because it's, it's solid, it's going to repel them, it's not going to allow, uh, allow the liquid particles in, and this way the bird volume actually cannot really do anything. But this way we would allow foam and splash to be born around the sphere. And... And when it happens, then foam and splash, they can leave this place and they can, uh, they can travel elsewhere, but uh, this is going to be the only place that uh, they could be really created. Actually, while we wait a bit for the scene to develop and our particles start to render, uh, if you have such a scene where you're interested uh, in the secondary particles and not so much uh, on the liquid, and for the second part, uh, by the secondary particles, I mean uh, foam splashes and mist. Uh, what we can do is turn the show checkbox next to the liquid, and this will leave only the other particles uh, in the preview. And as we can see right now, uh, the foam mist and splashes are born only around our active body. And, and yeah, the new thing that we wanted to show you was that uh, in Phoenix 5, now you can pick active bodies in node selector slots, such as the node selector for the bird volumes, such as the node selectors, for example, on the voxel and particle tuners. Or you could pick active bodies even as emitters inside sources. And yeah, basically everywhere in Phoenix where you could pick uh, a certain node, now, finally, active bodies can be selected there. Before, this wasn't possible, but now you can use active bodies as emitters so they can uh, do their active body thing and roll around and uh, just do their rigid body simulation and emit liquid uh, simultaneously. Or you could even go crazier with a setup that Georgi is going to show right now. Yeah, so essentially what we can do is we can pick, uh, for example, the distance to an object and if the distance is less than five voxels for example or let's say 10 in this case uh, what we can do is we can change the rgp for example but for this to work uh, i need to stop my sim and go and enable the rgb channel for our simulation so i can go into the output for all and enable the particle and the grid RGB channels. And what the RGB channel does is it stores color value that value data for uh, the simulations. And if I go in here in the dynamics row, we can say that our particles will be like green, for example. By default. By default. So if I start my simulation now, uh, all the particles should turn green. Yes. And because we have the particle tuner uh, working, what it does is it changes the color only around our, our active body. In this case, we told that we want to increase the red channel and uh, yeah, because we already have green, it turns into yellow. But for example, we could force it to red by uh, changing the increase by to, uh, I think it was set. Yeah. Like it said to one. And... Yeah, no, uh, I think actually this Ah, will, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's not gonna, yeah, it's not gonna help because they're still going to blend. But yeah. what we can do is, uh, I can, hmm. Shift drag my particle tuner. And 
we can do the inverse thing. So we can say if the distance to the sphere is greater than 10, then we can set the RGB green to zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> And yeah, there we go. So, so everything you... turned red, and in here it's yellow around our active body. So this is a, a nice way to control your simulation and give you a lot more control and creative possibilities to do crazy wild things. Maybe we can show the uh, active bodies uh, inside of sources. Use the meters yes. as well. Yes. Okay. So let's. Uh, reset the scene. And actually, uh, what we can do is let's let's show it with our speedball again. Oh, okay. Oh, who is trying to drag it? I messed it up. Maybe. Okay. Here it is. Here it is. So let me center it. And I remember that we needed to. Center of our field object. And okay. So once we are ready, uh, let's uh, create a speedball preset as a start, but let's modify it a bit. So in this case, we know that we can rotate our ball, but what I will do now is select our simulator and disable the initial pilot. Yes, <laughs> and I can do the axis lock and I can lock the translation in Z. So this way our boat won't fall down and we know that it will move straight forward without going up and down. And we have something like this. Okay, actually it's rotating, so we mm -hmm. need to <laughs> lock the rotation as well. And now? It should go in a straight direction. Okay. And now what we can do is we can create a liquid source. And I can pick again the original. Uh, when you pick uh, active bodies in sources or uh, uh, in particle tuners or whatever that you need to use active bodies, make sure to pick the original object because the active body clones that are created are deleted on uh, each start of a new simulation. So uh, your simulation won't work. Actually, let's try and do this and see what's going on. If I run the simulation, you can see that it says delete. So what you need to do is pick the original object. And if I start my simulation now, you can see that our boat will start emitting liquid and particles. But in this case, we want uh, our boat to emit only from the back in here, where the engine will be, for example. So what we can do is let's delete our simulation. I will select my original and let's go into the object properties and turn off the display as box for a bit. And let's delete the phone so that it doesn't get in the way. And in here, if I select my organs here and we can go and select these two and we can set an ID of seven for example. Seven is a good number. <laughs> okay. And what we can do now going on liquid source and go in here and for the polygon id we can set seven and if we start the simulation now we can see that our boat is emitting only from the back it's actually creating a lot of foam so probably this is uh, some remnant of the uh, setup that the two bar preset created so maybe we can just turn off the foam simulation and just leave Leave only liquid. 
Okay, maybe. And even squashes. Let's have just just directly. And eventually, if this works out, we could jam the walls of the simulator so that it won't escape. Ah, yeah, but we already uh, uh, walked the uh, the axis by using the axis walk. And also, it's time to delete the thruster so that we are sure that only the the source propels the active body forward. Yes. So let's go yeah, and delete the thruster. Uh, thruster simulation again. Yeah, see what happens. Okay, yeah, so so now just a little liquid is created, and now we can really boost the uh, discharge. And you can see. Uh, here it is. Woo! And we can boost it even more. And you can see that now. It really took off. <laughs> it really took off. And in this case, so actually, this is a nice example. You can see that we have uh, some lines, and our liquid emission is not continuous. So we have spots where there are no particles. So, why this happen? This is because our object is moving way too fast, and the simulation can't keep up. So, in case you have really fast. Uh, really fast moving objects, what you can do is go into the dyna dynamics roll and increase the step per frame. So let's try five, for example. At some point, I guess I rotate the ball a bit. Yeah, but still the axis walk keeps it under control. Okay, so now it looks a bit better, but obviously it's still way too fast. Yeah, we gave it enormous speed, so it's Kind of expected to uh, to uh, to need a lot of step, steps or frame in order to get like continuous emission from the source, but you can see that it's getting there. But we really, uh, yeah, we really made the boat just move very very fast. Yeah, actually, we can see that it's moving quite fast. If uh, our simulator is long h four meters and we cover h four meters in. Seven seconds. So in seven, seven frames. So uh, just, yeah, in seven uh, frames. Yeah, this is yeah, just a fraction of a second. Super fast. But yeah, you can see that increasing steps per frame uh, make our liquid emission uh, a lot better. Sweet. Yeah. So you could go crazy with uh, with your setups. In fact, yeah. If we want to be evil, we could just uh, remove the axis walk, make the walls jammed, and just uh, make the 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 speedboat. Bounce off, <laughs> bounce off the walls and see what happens. Yes. But yeah, maybe we could do this yeah, another time. <laughs> maybe next time. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go to the next thing. Uh, yeah, let's go back to the change work. So we okay. we took quite a quite a journey, quite 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 a detour. But yeah, uh, yeah new and enhanced presets. Uh, what else do we have? So we which, showed the uh, ice cubes and speedboats. So now you can set up active body simulations with just one click. So now it's much faster. We, uh, we, we showed, showed the, the, the stormy, sea. stormy Sea, and we also have a jet engine preset. It's uh, something that we had an example scene for a long time. We've been sharing it in the forums whenever people ask. So uh, yeah, we finally have it in the toolbar. It was waiting for a long time, and uh, yeah, it was uh, less than a day's work work to get it in. So yeah, sorry for the big delay. Here it is. <laughs> Here it is. So you click it. It creates a long simulator, and. This is how it looks. If I remember correctly, it used a, a discharge modifier to direct the jet downwards, but I think that downwards meant uh, downwards in the local space of the box. So, for example, now if you if you take the box and rotate it, it's going to no, don't stop it. Let it continue. So, if you if you rotate it like this, it's going to start discharging. To the side, or yeah, if you if you even rotate it 180 degrees, it's going to uh, start uh, blasting upwards. So yeah, it has a discharge modifier. It uses uh, a direction in the local space of the box. So it's basically yeah, it's walked on to the box and it's going to uh, produce the jet stream in that direction. Yeah. So uh, if you don't know what discharge modifiers are, uh, in here, uh, in the fire source, under the Outgoing velocity, we have this thing called modifiers. It's not only here, but we have it for all the other channels. And 
uh, in here we all we have already created one so uh, we have these uh, uh, arrows arrows let's yeah. call them thanks yeah, yeah. and uh, in here where we don't have ones so we have this plus sign but let's go uh, into the arrows in here and you can see that uh, the modifiers allow us uh, to modify uh, the specified channel uh, by a certain uh, modifier type. So in this case, uh, we're modifying uh, the emission uh, along the normal Z direction. And in this case, we use the object space. So uh, this way, uh, as we have explained already, rotating the uh, body uh, will have effect on the emission. And if you want to use world space, you can just go in here and choose world. And now, now it's going to yeah. emit downwards. Only no downwards. matter, yeah. yeah. No matter if I rotate it like so, you can see that it starts emitting from the other side. No matter how I rotate it, it will always use the z direction. And you can see that in here probably. Yeah, it's even trying to emit from both sides because they're inclined like 45 yes. degrees kind of so yeah if this was a sphere it it was going to emit only from from the lower uh hemisphere okay so this is how the jet engine preset works and it's quite fast to simulate and it looks really good so you can use it for engines gas stoves or uh whatever crazy thing that you can think of yeah. And I think that more more often than not, we've we've got requests for gas stoves rather than uh, jet engines or airplanes or something. So yeah, it's basically the same thing with just tweaked render setting. Okay, and the next preset that we have improved is the fire preset. Actually, uh, the old fire preset was a bit outdated already. It was a few years old and needed uh, reimagining. So uh, yeah, we didn't really like it, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, since it's the first preset on the toolbar, we saw it a lot on the internet and uh, thought that yeah, it was about time to improve it and make it better. And while this simulates, uh, I can show you a really nice addition that we have added uh, uh, in Phoenix that works uh, great with Jure. So uh, what I can do now, if I go in here. Yeah. And we can switch to V-Ray oh, GPU yeah. IPR. We can <clears throat> choose uh, start V-Ray GPU IPR. And this will continue running while our simulation is running on the CPU. Our rendering are running on the GPU. And currently, uh, it's building the GPU live cache, so that's a bit slower in this case. Where did my render settings go? Yeah, maybe it's closed on top and everything. Okay. Here they are. Here they are. So I can disable my GI for this shot, and we can start the IPR again. And here it is. It's sim it simulates on CPU renders on GPU at the same time. So basically we removed the limitation where when you start rendering, it has to pause the simulation. And then when the render is done, the simulation resumes automatically. So now with V-Ray GPU, uh, you can render and simulate at the same time. So if you have a good GPU and a good CPU, uh, you can load your machine much better. And uh, you can even do this in the viewport. So if I go in here and Enable the V-Ray viewport IPR, and we can see this is our rendered result. If I create an object, let me do it like so. And if we enable our GI back again, our fire should start casting light over our object. Yeah, so you could see that uh, while we had uh, GI off, uh, let's try to do something. Uh, okay. uh, while we had uh, our GI disabled, uh, the 
Vera IPR rendering looked pretty pretty much like the Phoenix GPU preview because the Phoenix GPU preview is not bad. And uh, but one of the things that it cannot do is actually illuminate the scene around the simulator. So uh, with Vera IPR, you would be able to get the proper lighting. And also, if if we add smoke into this mix, uh, of course, it would be shaded uh, much better than what the Phoenix GPU preview allows because the idea of the GPU preview is speed. But with the Vray IPR, uh, you can get also the uh, the stuff looking pretty good. So yeah, that's that's basically it. Yeah. But this is actually not everything. So you can see that until this moment, it took a few minutes to simulate and we can do even better because we added something new to phoenix 5 which is the phoenix standalone simulator so it's uh if you've seen v-ray standalone it's a, a console app which is a standalone renderer so for the v-ray standalone you're for example you are in max and maya you export vr scenes from max and maya which contain everything that v-ray needs to know about the scene and with the phoenix standalone simulator it exports sim scenes, which are basically yeah the same format as the VR scenes. They contain the simulation data, and uh, yeah you can see that it it's almost real time, so it's working pretty good, pretty pretty quick, and um, it's running significantly faster than the simulation in Max. And if we go back to Max, we can see that the result that we are getting for this particular setup is pretty much the same. The Phoenix standalone still has a lot of stuff that we need to add to it. So, for example, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't support animations on uh, on settings. You can you cannot animate options yet. Uh, you cannot animate the geometries, and the supported nodes are only the simulator and the sources right now. But it's running pretty quickly and. Yeah, from the Phoenix FD menu, you just uh, select Export Sim Scene, and you have the option to do uh, what Georgi just did to uh, start the simulation and simultaneously preview it with the Phoenix Standalone Preview, which uh, we've had for some time now. And uh, basically, when you do this, you can just close Max or close Maya and just let the Phoenix Standalone simulation run. So here's the Sim Scene, and yeah, if we go to the yeah, we can. It's it's just a text file. No, okay. I'll just uh, drag the the entire. Yeah. Okay. So this is how the scene looks. So it's in text format, which allows you to modify it afterwards. So let's say uh, in this case, our simulation uh, is starting from frame zero to frame one thousand. But uh, let's say that you need. Uh, a few hundred frames more or a few hundred frames less. So we can say uh, how about sim on the 10 frames and if we save the scene and run it, we'll simulate only till frame 10 without having uh, to go back and re-export the scene in max. So this way, uh, all these parameters in here are editable. So uh, if you know what each one does, uh, you can change it and uh, it will affect your simulation so that you can uh, tweak the scenes easily without uh, going back to max and uh, changing them there and then exporting the scene again. Just uh, having this uh, control uh, inside of a text file is really powerful. And for now, we have uh, something else as well. So for example, you can open this and you can just copy the path and open Explorer so that we can show something else that uh, we also added another tool to the Phoenix installation, which is the uh, sim scene node viewer. So if you just double click it, it's just going to open in the sim scene viewer, and here it is. So it shows you all of the nodes that are inside the sim scene, and uh, you can check all of the properties. You cannot edit them yet, but we imagine that uh, we are going to have this pretty soon. So uh, also the uh, the node the node viewer it also supports VR scenes so you can drag and drop uh, VR scenes from V-Ray and uh, inspect them here as well uh, so that you don't have to uh, deal with uh, the with scrolling the text editor and uh, figuring stuff out here you can see the separate nodes and the connections between them so it's a handy little tool that um, hopefully we would be improving in the future and yeah. Under Windows, by default, it's associated with uh, with 
you can just uh, double click it. You can just double click the sim scenes and open it in the, in the viewer. And uh, what else? Uh, so uh, since we mentioned association of uh, uh, different Phoenix files, we also made the Phoenix standalone preview associated by default with the uh, Aura caches of Phoenix, with uh, VDB files, with F3D files, and with PRT caches. So now you can just... So now yeah. we can go in this folder yeah. here. And I can double click on a cache. And what this will do is it will start my uh, uh, Phoenix standalone preview tool. Uh, and in here, it starts it with the my one. So that's why our cache is rotated to the side, but we can easily take this with the flip up axis. So it comes up flipped because Maya is using Y up instead of the Z up that is in 3ds Max. And now you can see that we have uh, the cache preview turn on and it works with the double click. And yeah. it, Looks like this. You can also check out VDB files, PRT caches from Krakatoa, and things can also export PRTs and uh, and VDBs. So uh, yeah, you can you can now inspect them easily uh, without having to open them in Max or My or Houdini or whatever. So you can just use the Phoenix Previewer to to check out those caches and see what's inside. Actually, so while we're talking about PRTs, uh, before we leave, so let's go in here and check the simulation. And we can see that this one simped in one minute and 20 seconds, 25 seconds. That's a lot faster than the other simulation that took around three minutes. So the Phoenix standalone is quite a lot faster for some things. Uh, so while we were talking about PRTs, so let me show uh, the fall how PRTs are working and how we can use them and what are they. Uh, I'm, I'm pressing the wrong button all the time, so that's why uh -huh. maximizing view is not working. So I can uh, create a burning fuel preset. And let me reduce the grid resolution, the grid resolution a bit. Yeah, it's, it's, ah, it's very low. Yeah, okay. it's, it's quite fast anyway. So, okay. so let's do it. It's going to grow because it has adapted to it. And the burning fuel preset uh, creates some frag particles in here. Uh, I have selected my simulation raw, and if you go in here in the cache file info, you can see that it starts creating some particles. So let's bump them up just a bit more. So what I can do is select my fire source, and in here for the particles, let's create 10 times more. We can turn off the GPU preview yeah. in order to see them better. I go into preview world and I will turn off the GPU preview and we can turn off the temperature and smoke and the fuel so that we can see our part. And I, maybe we have grid reduction? Yes, I think we have yeah. the reduction. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is how our particles look and if you wish to export them to a PRT format that is read by uh, other various applications you can right click in the viewport and there is uh, the export to PRT particles and in here we can choose uh, the frame range and which particle system that we wish to export in this case we have only one particle system and we can choose which particle channels we wish to export. So, okay. And let's create a folder called pure key. And it's particles and export. Now, if we go to the desktop and go in here, and if we double click, you can see that. Our particles are here, and if we scroll down again, let's flip the let's axis. Flip the axis, and we can see our particles, and you can see that the preview is quite fast. Again, this is uh, with really low number of particles, but even if with larger part, uh, 
larger number of particles, the preview inside of the Phoenix Previewer is a lot faster than the native ones of Max and Maya. Maybe we can increase the particle sizes in order to yeah. see it better. And here under the particle preview, we have a particle size. I just need to choose my particle system in here. Yeah. And we can see our particles. Okay. Uh, and so it works. Ah, yeah. And uh, something else that we added to, uh, to the new version of Phoenix is that now you can load PRT files directly into the Phoenix simulator. So before, uh, we had to use a separate node which was called a PRT reader. This node was available in Max, it was not available in Maya. But now we can load PRTs Actually, directly me, into the simulator. Let me make a brand new simulator. Yeah, because this one already had. Yep, here they are. And yeah, this way you can load PRTs in Maya, finally. So uh, what we still need to do is to allow you to export PRTs from Maya. So now you can export PRTs only from Max, but uh, this should be coming soon as well. We gotta do it. And what this allows us to do is read time particles as well. So I can lower down, uh, yes, yeah. but I needed an ID channel. So if I go uh, in here, in the fire source, I can enable the ID and let's enable the age, for yeah. example. And it prompts me uh, to ask which simulator I need to start. So, I need simulator, first simulator. Okay, it starts loading the particles from the second simulator. Uh, yeah, let's just delete. Maybe it has more than one step of frame, and this is why it's trying to read the data from the other simulator. Or we well. can just hide it. Yeah, this would exclude it from interacting. So now we have, yeah, now we're starting with much more particles uh, in the beginning. If we want even more particles, we could, for example, use the cigarette smoke preset on the toolbar. It's going to create a lot of particles. They are just going to look like a continuous stream of particles. And yeah, once again, the Phoenix Previewer handles them uh, very quickly and uh, it's, it's quite interactive. So, uh, I think this yeah. is quite enough. So here are how they look with the normal motion and the normal speed. And in here, these are the PRT particles. But we have to export them first. Uh, oh, these, yes, these yes, are, yes. These, these are, the, are old the old ones. Yeah. Okay, so let's. Something else that, that would be good to have is to allow exporting PRTs uh, simultaneously while the simulation is running so that we can write them to, uh, to the storage just like our files and just like uh, VDPs so that you don't have to go through the manual export process. So uh, I have to think about this. It shouldn't be too hard to do. And now, if I go in here, in the simulation, uh, uh, in the simulation world of our second simulator, and in the cache file info content, we can see that our particles have an ID channel as well. And now, we could even delete the first simulator just, just, just to show that there is no connection between them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, this is, that's good enough. Maybe we have some. Uh, detail reduction preview again. Uh, yes, so let's check the preview. No, nope, no, in this case, it's just less particles. Or did we? Maybe we didn't load the new caches. But if, I, if they have IDs, so they are the new caches? Mm. No. Nope. Or did I overwrite the caches uh, uh, on another know. place? Uh, I probably yeah. I recorded them uh, in in the default location, in the default yeah. location. So. Yeah, so we can just copy it from here. Yeah, uh, you can just you can just copy the the path. Here it is. And here, second simulator. Yeah, we can just delete the Phoenix macro. 
open. Here they are. Yeah, these are the correct ones. And now, if we reduce the play speed, like so, and you can see the part. Actually, let's hide the box so that it's not flickering all the time. And I will hide it. So, and we can see that our particles are moving way slow. So, this is a nice way of retiming uh, PRT files. Yeah, we can do this even with PRTs that are coming from other software. It doesn't have to be generated with Phoenix. And this is something that the PRT reader could not do before. And now that the simulator can load these, we can do all of the simulator things with them. Like this. Okay, so let's get back to the change work and see what's new. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing that uh, we implemented is realistic form patterns. So um, what we have before is we had some patterns for the phone, but they had all the same sizes and they looked a bit boring. So what we introduced now is some new uh, way of controlling the phone patterns. So let's create a liquid simulator like so. And go into the settings. I will lower the grid resolution so that our simulation runs fast. And I want to turn on our initial pillow so that we have uh, some liquid at the start. And let's go and enable the phone. Did we, yeah, actually, let's create a particle shader. Okay. And so that uh, we can create uh, some particles at the start. Uh, let's see first where our liquid is. So I will enable the show mesh option in the preview, go into the rendering trial and enable cap mesh and turn on pure ocean. So what this will do is it will show us the water level of our simulator, even without simulating. So now uh, this gives us a rough guide uh, where uh, our liquid will be. And now I can go in here and create a box. So, and let's position it on the surface of our liquid. So, and I want to emit foam from this box. So let's go into the right click menu and in the Phoenix properties, I want to make this box non-solid. So this way it won't interact with our simulation at all. It will just be used to brush foam particles. And let's right click and go into the object properties and I'm going to make uh, to display as box. So this way it will be invisible and it won't get in the way. And the next thing that we need to do is create a liquid source. Then from the liquid source settings, I will pick the box. Oops, no. Pick the box, like so. And we don't need liquid in this case. We need only particles. And let's create foam particles. Then what I can do is select our simulator and disable the pure option because we don't need it anymore. And let's start our simulation. And we can see that this immediately creates some uh, particles, but it creates them on the surface of our box. So this is because I have it in the surface force mode. So let's choose the bottom brush mode. And this should create the foam particles inside of our box, like so. And you can see that our foam now, it looks uniform and it's all the same uh, over the whole simulation. So actually let's brush a few uh, for the first five frames, for example, uh, some particles, and then we'll, we'll stop the emission. So I'll create an animation like so and offset the start keyframe 
like so. In this way, uh, on frame five, we have 100% for the brush, and on frame six, we have zero. Then let's start our simulation. And if I go into the foam settings now, in here, uh, we have controls for the foam patterns. Um, before, this option called here uh, formation speed was called strength, but we decided to rename it so that uh, it's a bit more clear what this option does. Is so if I uh, set this to one, for example, foam patterns are going to start forming. But uh, we have to, yeah, it, it has to happen when the form gets formed first. So, so yeah. we have to start the simulation again. Maybe we could also increase the number of uh, of foam particles uh, created yeah. from the source. So, so yeah, quite we, few. let's get a bit more foam particles. Let's try like this. Yeah. And what we can do is let's hide the mesh and the liquid particles so yeah. that. We can see only the foam. And now you can see that we have some patterns emerging. Yeah, maybe we can cut the mesh as well. Yeah. Here it is without any mesh. And yeah, these are the new default form patterns. They have two new options which allow you to change the uh, the size variation. So by default now they, they have some size variation, meaning that we have smaller and larger patterns. And we also have this option called stringy, which uh, just creates uh, those strings of particles between different patterns. So if we increase it... <clears throat> Let's try with one. Yeah, yeah. Let's see how it looks. It's just going to create those thin strings of uh, foam particles between the patterns. And uh, if we reduce it, they are going to be these uh, wider areas with more, with, with more uh, foam between the different patterns. Okay, so this is how it looks with the uh, stringy of one. And in here, you can see this is a uh, stringy of 0 0.5. Yeah, so if we set it to zero, let's see. Yeah, so now you can see that the <coughs> the foam patterns are. Uh, much less pronounced, so they are not that. Uh, um, they, are, they are a bit, yeah. So this is with zero, and this is with one. Yes. So basically, there is more space between the patterns, and uh, yeah. If we also reduce the size variation, even if we zero it, increase stringy back to one, then we are going to get the. Strongest effect and the uh, the most thin borders between uh, the foam patterns, and also we we have the radius control which we had before, which uh, it's in our world units, so right about centimeters. Yes. So essentially, uh, if you want bigger patterns, what you can do is you can increase this size. So let's try fifty. And this now will create bigger patterns. Um, yeah, yeah, here it is. Okay. 
Okay, and actually, uh, if you want to create more variation in your phone, sorry, a little nice trick that you can use is let's hide the patterns for now. So uh, we'll get only uniform foam around here. And what we can do is use a texture to modify the foam emission. So what we can do is go in here in the normal map and let's try a noise texture. And I will open the material editor and let's draw the texture. And if we do it like so, so that it's a bit more contrasting and start the simulation, you can see that now we have a lot more variation uh, in the form formation and if we make um, our texture fractal and change the size a bit so let's try 15 you can see that we have some variation now and now if i go and turn back our patterns so let's try one and increase our variation. Let's try it like so. Yeah, here it is. So first off, foam gets created and then the patterns kick in. So these patterns are no, way too large. large. Yeah, uh, way too large. Yeah, and also uh, here we have a setup where uh, our foam is created right at the beginning. So the, pa the patterns kick in all at the same moment and uh, then they just uh, die off but in a more dynamic simulation where you have foam created and dying all the time the patterns are going to be created all the time so uh, it's going to be uh, different and uh, it's going to also be more diverse and more interesting yeah so here it is and uh, yeah you can see the, the stringiness between the patterns here is uh, very clear and we have uh, some bigger patterns and some smaller ones and this way the foam looks a lot better in my opinion also uh, in phoenix 5 we made a lot of changes to the uh, parameter called b2b interaction which meant uh, basically how strongly foam sticks uh, uh, to uh, foam particles stick to one another and uh, this option and the splash liquid like option they got uh, a lot of changes so now they are both uh, more suited to uh, large-scale ocean simulations. And we also renamed B2B to Foam Volume, which I think better describes what it does. So this is the option that you should use when you want to simulate beer and coffee foam, uh, and you want to increase the foam volume in order to get more foam volume. Uh, so uh, if you want to, to get uh, like bigger chunks of foam sticking to each other, you have to use uh, this option so you can combine the foam volume with the new patterns and get some interesting crazy results as well and yeah with with more foam volume the, the foam patterns are not going to be so flat on the liquid surface so actually uh, so yeah. yeah we can um uh, create some sun. Lower the intensity a bit. Now we can render our foam. Oops, our helper box is renderable. And you can see that our foam now has some volume due to the foam volume option. Yeah, but beware because this option slows the simulation down. And uh, yeah, also uh, in this case, we have this foam volume, but if we create more particles at the beginning, uh, we can get larger chunks. So when we enable foam volume, the particles, uh, the actual foam bubbles uh, are going to uh, take into account their sizes uh, when, they fall, when they form these uh, larger chunks of foam. So uh, yeah, if we if we create even more particles, we are going to get uh, these larger, taller chunks of foam. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So now we have uh, really uh, many tools to create interesting foam patterns in ocean simulations. 
and these are not uh, now the the foam and the foam volume are not uh, just reserved for small scale beer and coffee simulations. They are much better suited to oceans now. And with this trick that uh, Gergi showed you, you can also start off your simulation with foam uh, already created in some areas and uh, missing in other areas in order to get even more interesting effects. So maybe we can move yeah, on. Yeah, let's go and check what's going on with the rest of the simulations. <laughs> 